Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event, The Point of View of the Universe, a Philosophical Conversation with Peter Singer. Our program this evening is the first of a spring term series of programs at St. Olaf College on contemporary controversies. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm a professor at St. Olaf College and Morrison Family Director of the College's Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring tonight's event and the spring series just mentioned. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and support free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, and the larger public. By exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society, the Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easier, comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. Thanks to all who have helped organize our event tonight. To remind our virtual audience members, you are invited to submit a question at any point during the discussion this evening by using the Participate tab on the streaming page. Our guest, Peter Singer, is regarded by many as the most influential philosopher in the world today. Peter Singer is professor of bioethics at Princeton University. His books include Animal Liberation, Practical Ethics, The Life You Can Save, and The Most Good You Can Do. These among his more than 50 authored, co-authored, edited, and co-edited books, to say nothing of his hundreds of articles published in scholarly and popular outlets. His work is often credited with inspiring the animal rights movement and in influencing attitudes to helping people in extreme poverty in low-income countries. He is the founder of the charity The Life You Can Save, which has raised more than 35 million US dollars for the most effective charities assisting people in extreme po poverty. In 2021, he was awarded the million dollar Berggruen Prize for philosophy and culture. He gave all the money away to a variety of chari charitable organizations, including those dedicated to the alleviation of extreme poverty and animal suffering. Since 2021, Peter Singer has been co-editor of the Journal of Controversial Ideas. Indeed, Peter Singer is a controversial philosopher for a number of the positions he has defended. Some take strong exception to his ideas, particularly his ideas related to human beings with disability. In recent days, I have had some intense exchanges with some who object strenuously to our hosting Peter Singer tonight. The Institute for Freedom and Community fully respects those who take issue with Peter Singer on matters related to human beings with disability. The Institute's purpose in inviting Peter Singer on the general topic of the point of view of the universe is not to promote any of his ideas, but to assess them in the spirit of free and open inquiry at the heart of academic freedom and at the heart of the liberal arts project. Much more might be said about Peter Singer's singular career. Other details are available on our Institute's website page dedicated to this event tonight. But for now, Peter Singer, thanks very much for being with us this evening. Thank you for that introduction. I'm very happy to be able to be with you and to speak to the community at St. Olaf College. Uh, Peter, before we uh, move to our central topic tonight, I was wondering if you could say a bit about the Journal of Controversial Ideas that you co-founded, I believe, a year ago with fellow philosopher uh, Jeff McMahon. With Jeff McMahon and uh, Francesca Minerva as well. There's three of us who are co-editing it. And uh, yes, although we published the first issue um, close to a year ago, it was some years in the planning. Uh, we the three of us were concerned about what we see as a narrowing of the field of ideas where discussion was accepted and one could write about ideas without either feeling that one was endangering one's career, particularly if you're a junior academic, not tenured, or that people were going to protest at you having a platform to speak at all, or even in some cases that you were going to get threats of physical violence against you. And so we thought, what can we do to try to defend uh, the freedom of expression uh, across a wider range of ideas? 
and we thought it would be useful to have a, a journal, an, an, an academic peer-reviewed journal that publishes serious, well-argued, uh, reasoned papers, uh, in which the, the authors did not have to put their name to those uh, papers, so that uh, they could avoid the kinds of, of damage or threats uh, that I have just mentioned. So uh, that's what we've done with the Journal of Controversial Ideas. We encourage authors to sign their articles, and uh, so far the majority of them have, but uh, some of them don't want to do that, and we allow them to use a pseudonym. Uh, if they later change their mind and think, well, I do want to be known as the author of this article, then we'll confirm that they are indeed the author. But for the present, um, they can write what they think, we'll get it reviewed by experts in the field, we won't publish it if it's not well founded and well supported, but um, they don't have to fear that they will themselves be harmed by putting those ideas out into the forum of ideas. And what kind of reaction have you gotten generally to the institution of this uh, new journal? Well, we've had quite a lot of support, and what's pleasing is that we've had support from across the political range. So if you look at our editorial board, for example, we have some well-known figures on the right and some well-known figures on the left, and some who wouldn't want to categorize themselves uh, on either of those wings of politics. But um, it's certainly not a journal that leans in any particular political direction. Uh, the criticism that we've had has probably mostly been from people on the left so far. That is, people who think that we might publish ideas that they don't think should be discussed. Um, and obviously that's possible. We, the first issue we published had a couple of papers on uh, transgender questions, and they've been very hot and controversial issues. And uh, so you know, that was probably one of the things that people thought maybe shouldn't shouldn't be discussed, articles that they would see as questioning uh, the right of somebody to identify as uh, a man or a woman. So um, we, also, we also published an article about the use of blackface, which is another controversial issue. It, it was an article that looked at some particular cases. It certainly wasn't taking a general stance, but it was looking at differences between different situations in which someone might use blackface, and is that always uh, the wrong thing to do? Is that always uh, a kind of an implicit racial slur? And, and the author concluded, no, often, yes, but not always. Are, are there any uh, topics, uh, subject matters, that you would simply not accept a paper on? Just no, I think subject. if a paper was well-reasoned and argued, and therefore it wasn't just like a, uh, a rant or a, you know, emotional venom or anything of that sort, but uh, was arguing in a, in a sound way for a, a controversial conclusion, we would not reject it because it was controversial. What we would do, of course, is to send it out to expert reviewers and make sure that the argument is really solid or that any empirical evidence that's been put up for the thesis uh, is strong and that there aren't obvious objections which um, the author might have overlooked. But if it stood up to that fairly, fairly tough, rigorous reviewing, we would publish it. Interesting. Well, I look forward to seeing the, the products as, uh, as uh, the journal unfolds. Uh, Peter, our, our, our central topic this evening is the point of view of the universe. Uh, and this is a phrase and concept that you borrow and adapt from the great 19th century British utilitarian philosopher Henry Sidgwick. Um, and this idea, the point of view of the universe, incorporates um, a central moral principle for you as it did for Sidgwick. Uh, could you say something about this idea, the point of view of the universe and the moral principle that um, it leads to in some sense? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and I should say to start that um, I don't believe that the universe actually has a point of view. I don't think that the universe is a conscious entity. Um, and I don't think Henry Sidgwick did either. Um, 
he was somewhat skeptical. Of, uh, he was, I suppose you could say, agnostic about religion. He actually, at one point, resigned his lectureship at the University of Cambridge because it required him to subscribe to the 39 Articles of the Church of England, um, and he felt he couldn't do that. Uh, later, the law was changed so that he could be reinstated. Uh, so it's a metaphor. Um, it's putting across the idea that we can detach ourselves from our own situation. You know, of course, all of us have networks that are, that are important to us. We have generally family, parents, perhaps children, uh, close family, close friends. And naturally, we think more about their interests and their well-being than we do about strangers. But the point of view of the universe asks us to try to detach ourselves from that for a moment and to imagine that you're taking on a much broader perspective where every being in the universe, or perhaps at least every sentient being, every being that can have experiences, uh, every being whose life can go well or badly for that being, um, really counts. And so by taking on that much larger perspective, we then get, I think, closer to what is a, a truly ethical standpoint, an ethical standpoint in which you don't give priority to your own interests just because they're yours or to the interests of people like you because they're members of your community or your country or your race or your religion or they speak the same language as you, um, but rather you just think about the well-being of all of those sentient beings and ask how much would um, an action, suppose I'm, I'm thinking about a decision that I have to make, how would that affect all of those beings in the universe? And in fact, not just beings presently existing, but as far as we can tell, future beings who will come into existence as well. And uh, that then gives us a, a, obviously a different perspective and gives us, uh, I think, different ethical judgments and, and I hope different decisions that we would make from those that we would make if we were considering something only from our own perspective or from the perspective of one of those smaller groups that I mentioned. Uh, how, uh, what is it that grounds um, this point of view that you are commending? I mean, why should we believe that it's true that we ought to take this universal moral point of view. Why not just pursue our own interests? I, I argue that um, it is in fact a requirement of being fully rational that we be able to take this point of view. If we don't, we're failing to see an important fact about the universe. And that is that we are just one being in that vast universe and that we have experiences, of course, we have desires, we can feel pain and we can feel happiness and satisfaction, but we're not the only being who is like that. There are m many others, billions of others who can. And if you don't take the point of view of the universe, um, and of course I'm not saying that you have to be taking it all the time, but if you don't take it when you have important decisions that have wide effects, then I think you're, you're just ignoring uh, this important fact about the universe that as a rational being, I can see and I can understand. And to not take that into account, I think is, is to make a, an error, which is, as I say, to some extent, an error of reasoning, but more seriously, perhaps uh, an ethical mistake. It's to ignore the, the fact that there are these other beings who from this more detached standpoint, whose, whose interests and feelings, if they're similar to yours, if they're as, as intense and as strong as yours, uh, should count just as much as yours. Uh, how is this principle, as, as you are advocating it, connected to your utilitarianism? Um, you are characterized as a utilitarian philosopher, and utilitarians believe in some sense that one ought to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number and minimize suffering for the greatest number, that sort of thing. But how does the principle of utility relate to this principle of uh, the point of view of the universe? 
Uh, it does relate, um, and it's it's no coincidence that I, I take it, as you said, from Henry Sidgwick, who was a, a utilitarian philosopher. Arguably, actually, although the, less well-known than John Stuart Mill or Jeremy Bentham, arguably the best philosopher of, of that trio, um, the, certainly the most careful philosopher. Uh, so um, I'd say that when we take this perspective, this point of view of the universe, that leads us to be concerned about the consequences of our actions for all of those sentient beings in the universe, all of those for whom it can make a difference in a sense of how well or badly their lives go for them. So I think it leads fairly directly to what I call a consequentialist viewpoint. That is, that in deciding whether an action is right or wrong, we look at the consequences of that action and ask, could the agent have done something which would have had better consequences? If so, uh, and better consequences you know, overall, all things considered. And if so, then that's what they should have done. And what they did was the wrong thing to do. Um, does it lead straight to utilitarianism? Well, there's certainly another step there. And that other step is to say, my concern for the consequences for others is about their happiness or misery or about their pain or pleasure. Um, though that's what the classical utilitarian said, that really what we really want to maximize is the net surplus of happiness over misery in the universe. Uh, so, so that takes a little bit more argument, I think, um, to say that the well-being of individuals consists in them being happier rather than more miserable. Some people find that fairly obvious. Others would say, well, no, you know, perhaps satisfying their preferences, even if they don't always prefer to be happy. Um, but satisfying their preferences might be what's most in their interests, most in their well-being, satisfying their desires. So, so there's a little bit more argument that comes into it. But uh, I do think that it's an important stepping stone towards that. Um, and it certainly leads you away from views that might judge whether you're living an ethical life in terms of just how well you're fulfilling certain roles. So some people might say, well, if you're a parent, then your role is to take care of your child. Um, if you're an employee, your role is to further the interests of the employer, of the corporation or university or whatever it might be you're working for. Um, if you're uh, a citizen, your role is to further the interests of your country. And a utilitarian would say, well, those may be good things to do in general because it may be that utility will be maximized if people act in these ways. Certainly if parents care for their children, that's a better way of bringing up children than any other way that has been devised. But it's not the only thing that's important. And there will be some cases perhaps where uh, even a parent or to do what is in the interests of strangers, uh, even if that's not in the best interest of their child. So uh, that's where the utilitarian view would differ from a, an ethic based on, on roles and duties. I see. Um, I want to explore another uh, possible reading of the point of view of the universe um, than the one that you are advocating, but it's one that you touch on in a piece that you wrote some years ago entitled The Value of a Pale Blue Dot. Um, and it goes something like this. Doesn't uh, the point of view of the universe, the immensity, the vastness of the universe, render all human preoccupations, including moral ones, insignificant? I mean, the history of the human race is an infinitesimally br brief moment in the history of the cosmos. And so isn't there something to the point that when you take, as, you, as, as, as one might, in, might be able to do in a kind of limited way, I suppose, the point of view of the universe, you're wondering just what the whole point of the human project is. In this piece uh, that you wrote some years ago, again, The Value of a Pale Blue Dot, uh, uh, you, take on, uh, you, you consider Bertrand Russell's observations about the fact that we live in this vast universe. And, um, and you say that uh, considering this does not lead to the kind of um, 
nihilism that some might think that it does lead toward. And I'm not sure what, what, what you would say in particular uh, to someone who says, well, you know, if you really take this seriously, uh, the human project is such a, a minuscule dimension of the universe as we comprehend it that uh, even moral preoccupations uh, seem uh, relatively trivial given the vastness of the universe. Right, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so I don't think that the vastness of the universe and its, its great age and the comparatively short time that our species has existed does show that human enterprises are insignificant. Um, it's the, the vastness of the universe would only matter if that shows that there are going to be a, a large number of other sentient beings in it. Now, there may be, it's uh, perfectly possible, in fact, you might say it's so vast that it's rather implausible that we are the only planet on which sentient life has evolved. I think that's probably true. But um, the fact is that no other sentient life has contacted us. We don't know of sentient life existing outside uh, the planet Earth. And uh, it may be that sentient life or perhaps more intelligent life is exceedingly rare. That could perhaps be the best explanation for why none of these intelligent aliens have ever contacted us. Uh, and if that's the case, then we are really important and our importance is not diminished by a vast number of stars with no life on them that uh, exist. Uh, they, on the ethical view that I've put forward, don't really matter at all. What um, is significant is our well-being present and, very importantly, future. And in fact, it's been suggested by some people in uh, the effective altruism movement that uh, if we are at least the only intelligent life around our corner of the universe, however big you think that corner might be, it could be the Milky Way galaxy, which of course is, is a vast space, or it could be uh, other galaxies nearby. If we are, then that actually raises the importance of our existence. Um, the late Oxford philosopher Derek Parfit said, perhaps we are living at the hinge of history. Um, we are, as you said, relatively young in terms of the universe. But um, we are developing technologies that if we survive for the next century or a few centuries, will probably enable us to colonize other planets. Uh, in fact, you know, maybe even in this century, we'll be able to colonize Mars. Certainly Elon Musk thinks that we will be able to. But, um, but if we take it further, um, there must be a vast number of planets, um, quite a few of them suitable for life, existing elsewhere just in the Milky Way galaxy, let alone other galaxies. So um, if we can do that, then our species is probably going to survive for a very long time, because even if there's a catastrophe on this planet, even if there's, uh, let's say, a collision with a, a huge asteroid that exterminates life or a, a nuclear war or a pandemic that uh, wipes us all out, um, there will be descendants, uh, our descendants on other planets and you know they may live for a much longer time than humans have existed so far, for millions, conceivably even billions of years. So the survival of our species on this view is really important for the idea that people can live and, and hopefully, as we learn from our past mistakes, live better lives, richer, more fulfilling, um, less troubled lives than humans have lived on this planet so far. Well, thank you. Let's, uh, let's trace some implications of the principle that you see as the outcome of the uh, point of view of the universe, which I, I, as I understand it, is a kind of uh, a, a principle of radical impartiality is the way I would characterize it. Uh, you're advocating, in some sense, the equal consideration of all interests that one might take into account. And interests are tied, in some sense, to the capacity for happiness, pleasure, or suffering. So in some central way, sentience is for you a principal concern. Um, uh, say a little bit about how that radical principle of impartiality has shaped your view of animal ethics. Right. So 
back in 1970, um, I was first challenged by, uh, I was a graduate student in philosophy at Oxford at the time, and I happened to have lunch with a Canadian graduate student, a man called Richard Keshen, um, who was a vegetarian. Um, and in 1970, that was really unusual to meet a vegetarian. Um, I don't know, I was 24 at the time. I don't know that I'd actually met a vegetarian or certainly not had a serious conversation about the ethics of eating animals with one. I probably met an Indian or some Indians who may have been vegetarians, but uh, I was not going to change my diet because of views that came from a Hindu background. Um, but uh, Richard was Canadian, had a you know, fairly similar set of views to mine, um, but thought that it was wrong to treat animals in the way they were treated uh, to be turned into our food. And while he was telling me this, I was eating meat. He wasn't. Uh, and I said something like, well, you know, don't, don't they still have good lives? Even if, yes, I, I know they get trucked to slaughter and I've followed those trucks and they must have a terrible few hours in those trucks before they get killed. But isn't that okay, given that they're out in the fields all day, um, you know, having a reasonably peaceful life, not having to worry about predators? And he said, well, you know, they're not anymore, or many of them are not anymore. They're in, they've been brought inside into factory farms. They've been closely confined, um, crowded together. There's not much thought given to their well-being. What really matters is the bottom line, how cheaply can we produce the meat or eggs or whatever it is that we're producing. Um, and I was a bit taken aback by this. I'd never thought of myself as somebody who's inclined towards cruelty to animals. Um, and I hadn't thought that perhaps by eating animal products, I was contributing to that cruelty. So I looked into it a bit more. Um, he suggested I read a book called Animal Machines by Ruth Harrison. I think it was the only book available at the time that looked at factory farming, particularly from an animal welfare point of view. And it, it was very convincing because it, it actually quoted from farming journals advising farmers how to treat animals. And you could see that there wasn't really concern for the well-being of the animals. There was concern for producing your product as cheaply as you can and, and I guess surviving in a competitive marketplace where there were no real rules or regulations about what you could or couldn't do to farm animals. So that got me thinking about the whole question of why is it that we have all these ideas about humans when it comes to ethics. It's it's you know very important to think that all humans are equal in some political uh, or philosophical sense. It's very important to think that they have certain human rights um, and to respect those rights. But once you're a member of another species, you don't have these rights. Nobody talked about animal rights at the time. And uh, we're able to do these things to you that I just described to... to produce your flesh or eggs or milk a little more cheaply. And of course, many other things that we do, including using animals in, in research um, and for entertainment. So um, I asked that question and I suppose thinking uh, about the point of view of the universe makes you think, well, it's not just a matter of putting yourself in the place of other humans. Um, it's clear that, that that isn't what counts. And you know, to illustrate that, let's go back to these aliens who haven't actually visited here, but imagine that they do, or that there's science fiction movies like E.T., the extraterrestrial, in, in which they do. And uh, suppose you said to E.T., who was kind of, kind of friendly extraterrestrial, um, well, uh, I'm going to cut you open and see what you're like inside because um, I'm curious about it. Um, and, you know, E.T. says, that's wrong, surely you can't do that. And I say, no, you're not a member of the species Homo sapien, so you don't have any rights, so I'm entitled to do that. But I think most people who'd seen that movie would think that was not the right way to act. So just being a member of this, or just not being a member of the species Homo sapien can't be sufficient to show that you don't have any rights. And therefore, it's possible that non-human animals do have rights or that in any way it's wrong to neglect their interests in the way that we currently do. Uh, and the more I thought about that, and uh, I looked at what some of the great philosophers of the past had said, sort of in justification of the way we treat animals, I looked at people like Thomas Aquinas, who was very influential, very influential in the Catholic Church's uh, moral teaching, and I looked at Immanuel Kant, who was influential, still is to some extent, among philosophers, um, and 
uh, and just what they said about animals just seemed much weaker than what they said on other topics. You know, I'm not saying that these people aren't good philosophers, but um, somehow it seems like when they came to trying to think about animals, the standard, their standard of reasoning just fell right away. And, and why would that be? Well, perhaps it's because they were eating meat and they couldn't imagine not eating meat. And so they had to find some justification for uh, killing animals for food. Uh, and, and that's basically the way I, I thought about it. And I thought we, we need to expand the circle of ethics here. We need to say, you know, just as in the past, we've got away from ideas that um, you only have duties to members of your family or tribe or country or race. Uh, so now we need to get away from the idea that you only have obligations to members of your species. That isn't something that can really be defended from the point of view of the universe. So from the point of view of the universe, uh, membership in the human species is not a necessary condition for warranting moral consideration, and therefore members of other species warrant our consideration. Um, and you also want to say that membership in the human species, the other side of the argument, um, uh, is not sufficient uh, for uh, identifying equal standing in some sense in the moral community too. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Um, and I think you can see why I think it's right by just looking at the questions about animals again. Because um, I don't want to say, for example, that uh, to kill a being like you or me or any, anyone else who's listening to this who is... Uh, a being who is self-aware, who thinks about themselves as an individual with a past and who hopes to have a future and maybe has a lot of thoughts and plans about that future and has been working for that future. Any student, for example, who's getting their degree because of things that they want to do once they have a degree is spending a lot of their time just doing things because they know or uh, expect that they will have a future. And to kill a being like that, I think, is much more serious and normally much more clearly wrong than to kill a being who doesn't have any of that, to kill a being who lives in a moment by moment basis or perhaps doesn't even have any consciousness at all. So if, if that's true, if we want to say it's worse to kill a normal human being because of the cognitive capacities that they have, because of their self-awareness, capacity to reason, capacity to think about the future, then uh, while that might bring some non-human animals into the equation, and, and in fact, all of the sentient ones to some extent, I would say, it does exclude some human beings. Most clearly, it excludes those who don't have any consciousness at all. And of course, there are some living human beings who don't. There are babies born with a condition called anencephaly, which means essentially that the only part of their brain that they have is the brain stem. The brain stem is the part that uh, works when you're asleep, that keeps you breathing, that keeps your heart beating, but it's not related to consciousness. And so a baby born with anencephaly will not smile when their mother enters the room or you know, feel pleasure uh, to, when they're touched in a pleasant way or anything of that sort. But that is still a living member of the species Homo sapiens. Do we think it's just as important that that being lives? That Do we try to keep that being alive as much as we would keep anyone else alive? No, in fact, we don't. It's, it's fairly standard in hospitals that, uh, well, firstly, if, if you detect that and carefully during pregnancy, most women would terminate the pregnancy. But if you're opposed to abortion and the baby is born with that encephaly, um, most physicians would simply advise leaving the baby alone, not giving the baby any intensive care, not attaching the baby to a respirator, not putting a feeding tube into the baby. Um, and so those babies typically will die quite soon after birth. And you know, I, I think that's a reasonable course to take. But it does suggest that we don't really, when it comes down to it, we don't really think that they have the same right to life as as you or I do, or, or most other human beings do, um, we kind of we, we kind of evade it by saying things like, we're, "Well, we're just letting nature take its course." But I think that clearly is an evasion. 
we made a decision not to treat this baby in the same way that we would treat a normal baby who maybe had some temporary need to be put on a respirator or to have a feeding tube put in. Uh, well, this is uh, no surprise, uh, uh, an area of philosophy, of course, that has elicited some fierce, uh, uh, area of your philosophy that has elicited some fierce uh, opposition in various ways. Uh, people are concerned that, a, that if you take the line that you do, um, uh, the, you are going to depreciate uh, persons with disability. Um, that you are implying that their lives are not worth as much as the lives of those who lack those disabilities. Now, when you have heard these criticisms before, you have often said that persons who uh, advance these criticisms are misunderstanding your position or they're not fully comprehending it. I mean, in what respect do you think that you are being misunderstood uh, on these matters by, say, certain members of the disability community? Well, one misunderstanding is that people take my view to be a general one about people with disabilities um, uh, rather than one that is particular about people who either are not capable of consciousness at all, as in the case of the anencephalic that I just mentioned, or who are conscious but are likely to have a life that is uh, one with a lot of, of suffering and pain in it, or generally a life that is going to be clearly less positive than the lives of others. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that any disability makes your life less, less positive. Many people cope extremely well with disabilities and have rich and rewarding lives. Um, and I, I find it sometimes strange that somebody who, let's say, is in a wheelchair, but um, because of a, a physical disability, but um, you know, is, is every bit as, as bright and thoughtful as you or I are, maybe more so, um, thinks that they're somehow therefore a spokesperson for somebody with profound cognitive disabilities who's uh, clearly not capable of speaking for themselves um, and uh, may not be conscious at all in some cases or may be conscious in a way but not in a way that gives us any confidence that they're having positive experiences. Um, so that's that's one misunderstanding that I think comes out. I'm, I'm certainly, you know, I, I, I hate to be thought of as somebody who's in general hostile to people with disabilities. Um, I support people, for example, in their efforts to get um, into, uh, into society and participate fully in it. I um, support laws that make it a crime to discriminate against people when employing them for a job that they're capable of doing, but uh, because they have a disability that is not relevant to their capacity to do the job. Um, similarly for housing and other areas. Um, I support moves to make buildings and other places more accessible to people with disabilities. I mean, none of that has anything to do with my views about people who are, um, have you know, very different kinds of disabilities that uh, we can't really compensate uh, for them. We can't really do things that will make their lives be as good or close to as good as, as the lives of people without those disabilities. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let's shift the discussion a bit to uh, questions of global poverty. Um, and the distinction you drew earlier in your comments between uh, those who are close to us, neighbors and strangers, that is say persons on the other side of the world. And of course, uh, you are famous for the uh, example of the child drowning in a pond um, and uh, persons who might walk by and not help the pers uh, child out in the pond. And you think that uh, how we react to that example uh, has implications for how we understand uh, uh, serious poverty in the world and what we might do about it. Could you say something about that pond example and how that relates to the issue of uh, riches and poverty and so forth? Sure, right. So in the example, um, you're, you're going somewhere for some special occasion and you've put on some of your best and most expensive clothes um, but you're taking a shortcut across a park to get there when you notice that there's uh, 
a small child who's fallen into a pond um, and appears to be in danger of drowning. Um, now, you know that the pond is a shallow one, that uh, you could jump into that pond, uh, grab the child and save them from drowning. And there doesn't seem to be anyone else around who's about to do that. So if you don't do it, the child is, is highly likely to die. But because you're wearing these expensive clothes, the thought occurs to you that you'll ruin them. And you say, well, look, this child isn't my child. This child is not my responsibility. I never promised to anybody that I'd take care of this child. Why should I have to go to the expense and trouble of, of getting new clothes just to save this child? I'm going to ignore the child and just walk on and go to my appointment. Now, most people think that that would be a, a really terrible thing to do, that you would have to be a kind of a moral monster to say, well, no, I don't want to ruin my nice clothes, so just let the child drown. Um, and I'm glad people have that reaction, of course. But I then ask them to think about our situation in respect of the wider world. And by our situation, I should say, I mean, people like you and me, and I think many of the people listening to this, who are living in an affluent country, who are not among the poorest in that country, who are, let's say, middle class or above, who think nothing of spending $3 on a, on a coffee or um, a smoothie or something of that sort, and probably who don't think very much about spending hundreds of dollars to upgrade their phone, even though the phone works reasonably well as it is. So... Uh, or, or, or on buying expensive new clothes, just to make it closer to the pond example. So um, we are spending money then on things that we don't really need. And yet there are children in the world and, and adults too, who are dying because they lack the basic necessities of life or they lack protection against diseases that can kill them. For example, there are many millions of children in malaria prone regions who don't sleep under a bed net. Bed nets are inexpensive. Um, we can help organizations that are very cost effectively distributing bed nets in those regions and therefore expand their reach to more countries. And by doing so, we'll save lives. We won't save the life of a child we can see. Um, we won't ever really know whose life has been saved because we have to give out quite a lot of bed nets. And then we know that statistically we'll have saved uh, one or two lives by, by giving out those bed nets. But we won't know which children they are. Um, similarly, we can improve sanitation so they don't die from diarrhea. We can encourage immunization of, against various diseases. So, that, so on. There's lots of things we can do. And if we know about this, then, uh, and yet we say, no, I'm going to buy new clothes or the bottle of water that when the water that comes out of the tap is safe to drink. Um, uh, and I'm not going to give to these organizations. I think we are in a somewhat similar situation to the person that, as I said, you know, my, most of you, I hope, condemned for walking past the child in the pond. Uh, emotionally, it's a little different because you don't see the child. There's no, as I said, no identifiable child that you can say, oh, I'm responsible for the death of that child and the grief of their child's parents. Um, but it will be happening. Uh, and if we take the point of view of the universe, then just the fact that the child is not close to you physically doesn't really make a moral difference. What, what is important is, can I help this child? And because you can donate to effective organizations and you can find out incidentally which they are by going to the website of the charity I founded, The Life You Can Save, uh, lifeyoucansave.org, um, and there are other organizations that assess independently assess these organize these charities. So you can find out which they are um, and you can donate to them. Uh, and if you have now heard that and you don't donate to them, how are you better than the person who walks past the child in the pond? But how radical a principle is this? I mean, the point of view of the universe suggests, at least the way you characterize it in different contexts, as radical impartiality, right? So mm -hmm. um, we do all sorts of things for our own children that it seems to me would not survive your moral scrutiny, <laughs> um, given the pond example and given what you think we might do as an alternative. Um, um, is, are you saying that parents should not favor their children 
and that that is what is warranted by the point of view of the universe, that there's something uh, grossly immoral about a certain kind of favoritism that parents show their children, such that the consequence being that people, uh, children on the other side of the world, don't live quite as well as they might um, simply because we do favor our children in that way. I mean, how radical a principle is this? It is quite a radical principle, but it does have to be tempered by relevant in fact, human nature. Um, I do think there's some sense in which, yes, we ought to be significant in the preferences we give to our own and greatly increasing the preference we give to, to strangers. Um, and, uh, but I don't go so far as we should be radically equal, that we should bring ourselves and our children down to the same level as children in extreme poverty. And it's only then that we should um, say, okay, we've done enough. Um, I think rather that Given the human beings, given the human nature, we have to accept people will have some preference for their own children. Um, we can't really reject that. Um, it's difficult for people to live with, and it may actually not be a good thing for future generations of children if they don't feel especially loved and privileged by um, their parents and people who love them. So. I'm not going to blame people who give greater weight to the interests of their own children than they give to the children of strangers. But I am going to say this should still be tempered by the fact that we know that there are uh, so many children out there who, in need who would benefit from our giving, our helping them more. And, and certainly there's a level of indulgence of our own children of the idea that we need to do everything possible for our own children that I do think is wrong and we should be discouraging. Thank you. Um, when you say it's a matter of human nature to attend to your own children, uh, is that uh, a kind of regretful concession? Or do you think there is moral force to being concerned about your own children in a way that you're not concerned with other children? The, the moral force comes from the fact that I think children are better raised in close loving families than in any other system that has been devised. I and mean, people have tried to raise children communally, sometimes in, you know, with the best of intentions, like in the Israeli uh, kibbutzim, the collective settlements where uh, idealistic socialists raised children collectively so they wouldn't be benefited or favored by some parents being, you know, indulging them more than others. Um, but it didn't really work very well. And generally that's been abandoned uh, in those collective settlements too. So we do want to encourage parents to love their children. And if we do that, then inevitably we're going to accept that they're going to treat those children better than others. So, um, I don't really see it as a as a moral failing. Uh, if we were different kinds of creatures and if children thrived when brought, in, brought up collectively, um, I might think that that would be a better world, that there would be fewer children suffering because their parents don't have the resources to look after them. And I might therefore think that was a better world, but that's not the world we live in. And there's no point in you know, lamenting that fact. What we need to do is to do the best we can in the world that we live in. And that will include, on the one hand, uh, having an ideal of which parents love and cherish and care for their children. And on the other hand, encouraging them also to think that they do need to think about the children of strangers in the inegalitarian world in which we live. Um, some of those resources should be channeled to do the most good that they can do. And that is going to mean directing them away from your own family and your own affluent community and helping people in much less affluent in, in impoverished circumstances elsewhere in the world. Yeah, just one more uh, line of inquiry on this matter. Uh, I'm wondering how you react to this. 
let's think about a uh, person. I'm going I'm to call them uh, Joe or Jane Insulation. That is to say, the guy or the gal who works 45, 50 hours a week blowing insulation into the walls of other houses and then comes home to the yelling kids just too exhausted to think about anything other than jumping on his, her, their snowmobile rather than not buying one to save a life of someone living on the other side of the world. Um, Joe or Jane Insulation doesn't have the same kind of liberty or privilege as, uh, let's call them Joe or Jane Academic <laughs> or Ed Santuri or Peter Singer, who have the leisure, so to speak, to act with the point of view uh, of the universe in mind. What do you, what do you say about that, that, uh, that uh, what you propose is, uh, in some respect, uh, reflective of a kind of position of privilege and leisure and really doesn't speak to the person who lives a rather day-to-day -day difficult life and it's just all he or she can do to, to get by. Yeah, I'm, look, I, I'm, I'm not one who wants to make people in you know, circumstances, difficult circumstances, feel guilty for um, relaxing and having a bit of uh, pleasure now and again. So um, I, I don't really want to blame people who are not living up to the standards that i am been talking about. Um, I rather want to encourage people who can do that to do their best to do it. And I recognize that uh, other people do have a much more difficult time of it than you or I would. Um, I don't think it requires affluence, by the way, but um, because I, I know people who are actually you know, don't have very much spare cash, but nevertheless are giving what they can spare to effective charities, and they're feeling good about that and feeling satisfied that they can do something. But but your Joe or Jane, uh, you know, really having a tough life, just earning enough to keep the family in moderately decent circumstances, I assume, uh, and then they have this one indulgence, which is to run around on the snowmobile. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really pointing the finger at them and saying, hey sell that snowmobile and give the money away. Um, I accept that people will do these things, um, but if they do get into a better state where they're less harassed, they can't uh, just you know come home exhausted from work and, and feel that they need to stop thinking about things and get out into the wild, um, then maybe at some stage in their life, they will be able to think about these questions. And, and that's why I want to put them out there because I think, Many people at different times of their lives come to, to these things um, and are able to do more. You know, I, I co-founded The Life You Can Save with a, with a guy called Charlie Bressler, who wrote to me after having had a career in the men's clothing uh, retail industry, um, which he'd done, and he'd earned some money doing that. Um, but um, he'd always felt that wasn't quite really living up to the values and ideals that he'd had when he was younger. and so decided that he had enough of it and he wanted to do something else and he wanted to help other people and he was you know the driving force between behind building the life you can save as a as an effective organization so you know other people your, your joe and jane may be too harassed when their children are small to, to think about these issues but eventually their children will grow up and leave home and then they may pause to think about their ultimate values and what they should be doing with their lives okay thank you I think now might be a good time to uh, move to some general Q&A from our audience. In some cases, questions submitted uh, beforehand uh, or in uh, real time. And let's start with the first uh, video question. In your book, Rethinking Life and Death, you argue that we as a society should not see all human lives as of equal worth, but recognize that some are more valuable than others when considering the ethics of involuntary euthanasia. Aren't you setting a dangerous philosophical precedent for the rights of disabled and injured persons with this unequal value system? For example, you argue that life without consciousness has no value. That may or may not be true, but regardless, a person in a coma should have the right to autonomy and proper medical care. These rights would hopefully persist regardless of their capacity to interact with the world around them and do not disappear as soon as a person loses consciousness. In the case of involuntary euthanasia, aren't you stripping these people of their right to life? 
or do you consider this morally justified on the grounds that these people are no longer living a life you consider to be utilitarianly valuable? Thanks for the question, Sam. Uh, so you mentioned a person in a coma and it's really important to say, does this person have a chance of coming out of this coma or not? If the person does have a chance of coming out of this coma, um, and you know we have reason to believe they could then resume the life that they were living before and that that was a good life and probably they're, they're loved by people close to them and so on, then of course we should continue to treat this person in the coma to, to maximize that chance of returning to that life. But if we can know, let's say we've done careful scans of the brain and we know from these scans that uh, the entire cerebral cortex has been destroyed, the cortex being the you know, the part that is related to consciousness. They may have a brain stem that is keeping them breathing and keeping the heart beating, but um, there is no prospect at all that they will ever return to consciousness. Then I don't think that it makes sense to talk about protecting their autonomy. They have no autonomy anymore. They're not capable of making any decisions. And I also don't think that they have rights um, or such, as a, such as a right to life. I do think that uh, you know, if we're going to talk about rights to life, they have to be based on something that beings have. And that would have to be something to do with at least some level of consciousness. I think if you're a conscious being, you could argue, you know, as a utilitarian, I tend not to talk in terms of rights very much. But if you want to talk in terms of rights, you could say, if you're a conscious being, you have a right not to have suffering or pain gratuitously inflicted on you. So nobody should make you suffer just because they enjoy watching you suffer or uh, for other trivial reasons, not because they want to test a, uh, uh, a food coloring on you either. But um, do you have a right to life? I think really that if you are irreversibly unconscious, will never recover consciousness, your life as a person is over. You are alive as a biological organism, but I don't think that, you know, if let's say this was Jane um, from uh, uh, the previous example, um, who was a loving mother and who enjoyed going out for rides in the snowmobile and so on. Jane is never going to do that again. Jane is never going to relate to her children, never going to enjoy rides on a snowmobile or anything else. Um, so I think that there no longer is a being who has rights at that point. We simply have a living human organism. And as I've said earlier, I don't think the fact that you're a member of the species Homo sapiens in itself is enough to give you rights. Um, and of course, you know, if we, if we had a dog in that situation, even if we'd loved that dog and the vet said, look, your dog is just going to lie here now for, you know, we could, ventilate the dog and keep the put a feeding tube into the dog and the, the dog would lie here for uh, another couple of years maybe until the natural lifespan was over nobody would do that no nobody would think that's a good thing to keep this organism this biological organism breathing and the heart beating and you know sadly i think the same is is true for a human who's irreversibly lost consciousness as well Thank you, uh, Peter. Let's uh, move to a text question. Now, this from Finn Johnson, class of uh, 22 from Northfield, Minnesota. Is speciesism truly analogous with racism or sexism, as you've said in the past? It seems like the concept of competing interests is central to the latter two con concepts to a degree not present in the first. For instance, it would be racist or sexist to reject someone's job application in favor of another's because of the first applicant's race or gender. Does this same general idea of neutral bias work with speciesism? Uh, thanks, thanks for that question. So uh, we haven't actually, I haven't used the term speciesism uh, so far this evening, but um, as people will gather from that question, I, I do use it to make uh, a, an analogy between the way that, say, the European, white European race uh, used Africans as slaves, um, where it would never have used other Europeans as slaves in that way, just made a 
distinction. They're not members of our race, so we're entitled to capture them and to use them essentially as as tools to work our plantations. Uh, and of course, um, males have also had attitudes to women, which have been somewhat uh, similar to that. Not again, racism and sexism are not identical, but the, you, we can see parallels in the way that males have dominated women and said, well, they're, they're not they're not men, so they don't have the right to vote or they don't have the right to um, own property at various times, or you know, they need to do what uh, fathers or husbands tell them to do. Um, so I think that speciesism, our attitudes to other species, does have some analogy to that. Um, like any analogy, it's, it's not perfect. But um, in terms of the particular examples that were mentioned there, uh, we don't, we don't uh, invite animals to apply for jobs. They can't do that. And so discrimination in uh, employment, for instance, isn't going to apply to them. But we do use them in ways that we don't use humans, even though we might benefit from using humans even more than we use would benefit from using animals. For example, um, so I think I, I just mentioned in passing before, we will use animals to test uh, new ingredients uh, like a food coloring or um, used to be used, used them for testing cosmetics. In fact, there are still some cosmetics tested on animals, but fortunately because of the work of the animal rights movement, less than previously. But uh, we certainly use animals in research in ways that we do not use humans. Now, um, you know, in a sense, that's a competing interest. The animal has an interest in uh, not suffering, um, not having, not being injected with large quantities of some substance that we're trying to test, quantities that perhaps will be enough to make that animal very sick or, or kill that animal, uh, and the animal will suffer a lot in the process. Uh, and we would not do that to humans. Um, we would not do that even to humans who were cognitively disabled and no more rational or self-aware than the uh, animals that we do use for those tests are. So I think that shows, if you like, conflicting interests and the fact that we ignore the conflicting interests of the animals or uh, certainly override them in circumstances where we would we do not ignore the conflicting interests of the humans. And so I think that in that case, the parallel between speciesism and the way that in the past, um, as I say, uh, white people used Africans as slaves uh, is, is not all that, you know, I'm, I don't want to say they're the same. Of course, I'm not equating uh, Africans with non-human animals, that would be a horrendous uh, thing to make and a complete distortion of what I'm saying. But the attitudes that we're the dominant group and therefore we're entitled to use them um, is similar in both those situations. Thank you, Peter. Next video question, please. Hi, my name is Greta Hallberg, and I'm a junior at St. Olaf submitting a question on behalf of the Public Affairs Conversation. Mr. Singer, in your short essay entitled, Is Doping Wrong?, you highlight the opinion of bioethics professor Julian Savalescu that athletes should not be prevented from doping in preparation for athletic competitions, provided the drugs they take do not compromise their physical well-being. According to Savalescu, the allowance of performance-enhancing drugs in competition would not contribute to inequality, but would in fact level the playing field for those who are genetically disadvantaged from an athletic performance perspective. The conversation around performance-enhancing drugs is particularly topical when one considers the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, Russia's ban from the Games due to the country's notorious doping scandal in 2014, and recent reports that the Russian Olympic Committee's 15-year-old figure skating star Kamila Valieva tested positive for performance-enhancing heart medication shortly before the Olympic competition began. With all of this in mind, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on your current views on doping. Do you agree with Savalescu that performance-enhancing drugs may contribute to a level playing field for athletes with different gen genetic backgrounds? Or does the use of banned substances compromise the integrity and merit of athletic competitions like the Olympic Games? Thank you so much. Thank you for raising this uh, interesting and, as you say, uh, very timely topic. Um, 
I don't entirely agree with uh, Julian Savalescu that we should simply allow um, athletes to use uh, drugs, performance enhancing drugs, um, subject only to them not really harming them. Uh, um, if we did, then I think we would, to some extent, turn these competitions into questions of, of who have who has the best uh, lab behind them producing these drugs and finding the best drugs to enhance performance. And uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to see that. Uh, for one thing, that would just be a sort of distortion of the best use of the scientific knowledge and, and potential. Um, but I, I regard Savalescu's article as interesting because it points to some of the peculiarities about the standards that we do have and uh, raises questions about that. So in, in, in different ways. So for example, one thing that, that you can do um, is you can spend time at, at high altitude. You can go and live somewhere at high altitude and train at high altitude and enhance your uh, lung capacity that way. And that may give you an advantage in some athletic events when you then compete um, coming down to sea level. So um, you know, that requires, you know, not, not all athletes can do that. That, that isn't a level playing field. It, it costs money. Um, some countries have places at high altitude, some don't. So you may have to travel internationally to do that and support yourself. Um, so that's one kind of thing. And, and you could say Savalescu is raising the question, why do we allow people to do that um, and not allow them to take drugs? Then, you know, an, another interesting point is that uh, Savalescu is making is that we have discovered genetic differences between people, which, which give them advantages, give them advantages in uh, the extent to which, for example, they uh, get oxygen into their bloodstream um, to help them compete. Uh, and does this make it unfair? So, you know, you train as hard as you'd like, uh, you're, you're generally physically normally fit person, um, and, and yet you're not going to get the gold medal because you don't have this unusual genetic predisposition that uh, somebody else in, your, in the field does. Um, what are we going to do about that? Well, in a sense, you could say we, we, we haven't decided anything about that. We just let people compete in that way. We are now having debates about people who are um, intersex or something of that sort. We've had that kind of debate. People who are competing as women but have some male characteristics um, and, and there's questions of how you draw the line there. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of things that you, know, you could question about whether we do have a level playing field or what it even means to have a level playing field. Um, and of course, uh, as the you know, current doping issue, as you say, with the Russian skater shows, um, it's not always easy even to detect who's who's using drugs, and some people, you know, may may have got away with it who um, were using drugs. So it, it does have its downsides, um, but I, I don't have a better solution than trying to keep drugs out of sport. Um, we could, I suppose, have different kinds of events. We could have drug-free events and and drug plus events, um, and see how people do that could be interesting. It's, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. We're making, we're making choices about what kinds of competition we want. Uh, we're doing that all the time. As I say, most obviously in these questions of people with intersex characteristics, but um, we're doing it in a lot of other ways with less obvious genetic differences too. Thank you, Peter. Uh, here's a question now from Abigail Hollinger, uh, class of 2023 from St. Olaf College. You have said that if infants are born with disabilities, such as Down syndrome and spina bifida, then parents should be allowed to euthanize them because, and I quote, quote uh, the child's life prospects are significantly less promising than those of a normal child, end of quote. First, why do you, an able-bodied man, believe you have the right to speak about how a person with a disability experiences life? Communities of people with disabilities are not saying that they are suffering or unhappy. They have a good quality of uh, life, just like you. It may just look a little different. So shouldn't we listen to the people with the disability rather than you, uh, who does not experience life as they do? Do you recognize that your rhetoric pushes ableism and giving parents this action encourages their ableist bias? If you believe in effective altruism, 
isn't ending a life that is not suffering against that principle. Thanks, Abigail. There's uh, a lot there in that question. Firstly, you began by saying, what, why do I think that I have a right to talk about this issue being an able-bodied person? Um, so I think everybody has a right to express their views. Um, and we are on a Institute of Freedom and, and Community uh, platform. Uh, so um, I have a right to express my views. You have a right to express your views. Of course, you have a right not to listen to me. Um, you don't have to. And if you do listen to me, you have a right to express your strong disagreement with me. That's fine. But that's all within the framework of, of freedom of expression. So I think the question should not be, do I have a right to say these things? But am I justified in saying these things? And should you agree with me? Or should you disagree with me? Now, you then said something like, um, why am I speaking on behalf of people with these conditions? Well, um, depending on the condition, if the condition is a profound or severe cognitive disability, those people can't really speak about their condition. They can't engage in the kind of conversation that we're having. Down syndrome is, is a case where some people, you know, it, it, there's a whole spectrum of people with Down syndrome, as we know, and some people could have the, this kind of discussion to some extent, um, and, other, and other people with Downs could not. So, um, so there's a range there. Um, you also mentioned spina bifida. Uh, most people with spina bifida don't have cognitive disabilities, although some do, less commonly now because of better treatment of the buildup of fluid on the brain, uh, the hydrocephalus. Um, but uh, it's not the case that everybody with spina bifida um, is, is glad that they're alive. Um, there certainly are people who've questioned that, and I've... Um, you know, people who've had repeated operations and repeated struggles and problems. Um, and uh, people with disabilities have written to me saying, um, you know, I think that it would have been better if I had been allowed, you know, not lived because my life has been a constant struggle and hardship. So um, I don't think we should assume that those who are speaking positively represent everyone. Uh, the, other, the other thing, the other entity who is not represented, of course, uh, well, firstly, there's the parents. And again, parents have written to me and said that because I remember one letter a man wrote to me, he said, the doctors got to play with their toys and then presented my wife and me with this severely disabled child uh, and basically handed the child over to us and said, now you look after him. Um, and uh, that this person wrote, the father wrote, has been a, a struggle. I don't think it's been good for my child. I, it's certainly not been good for me and my wife. So, you know, they need, their voices need to be heard too. But then the voice that we certainly can't hear is the voice of the child who wasn't born because the couple had a child with a disability and that child's lived. And therefore they felt, you know, they couldn't really have another child because they had to manage to cope with that child. And uh, again, there are parents of whom this is clear. There's a book called The Long Dying of Baby Andrew by a woman called Peggy Stinson, who uh, had a child who was very premature and who was clearly going to be severely disabled because of brain damage as a result of the premature, prematurity. But the doctors were trying to keep that child alive against the parents' wishes. And the she actually says, she's not a philosopher, but she says in her kind of chronicle that she was keeping, um, that her husband and I have to make a decision about the child who will come into existence if Andrew, that was their baby's name, if Andrew dies, because they didn't feel they could have another child if Andrew lived. But uh, if Andrew died, they could go and have a child who would very probably have a normal and much better life, uh, the mother thought, than their child would. So there's a whole lot of voices that come into this conversation, not all of whom are being heard or, or even there. And that's why it's a, a more nuanced and complex subject, I believe, than you've suggested. Now, just one final thing. You, you said, you know, am I encouraging ableism? Well, um, it depends what we mean by ableism, right? Uh, I don't think that ableism is analogous to racism or sexism in the sense of being a completely unjustifiable form of discrimination. Um, most people would prefer to be able-bodied than not able-bodied. Most people who, are, who have a, a significant disability 
whether they're in a wheelchair, whether they're blind or deaf, would, you know, if, if you said, look, here's a pill you could take, cost a dollar, no side effects, and you will be able to walk again, or you won't be blind, or you'll be deaf, most people would say, great, give me the pill, please, now. Um, not everybody, but most people. So um, I think the idea that it's better not to have those disabilities is a defensible idea. And that's why, to some extent, sure, I encourage what I believe to be justifiable ableism. As I said before, I don't at all accept the idea that it's, ex you know, that we should discriminate against people who are equally qualified for a job because one of them has a disability that isn't going to prevent them carrying out the job as well as anybody else. Um, or for that matter, going to an educational institution or getting housing or any of those things. That kind of ableism is clearly wrong, but there's another kind of ableism that I think is justifiable. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next video question, please. Hi, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Olivia and I'm a junior with the Public Affairs Conversation Program. In a chapter entitled, Is There Moral Progress? in your book, Ethics in the Real World, you explore whether or not our morality has progressed since atrocities like the Holocaust and the killing fields of Cambodia. You provide recent poll data that suggests that different genders, races, and ethnicities are treated more equally than they were previously, and that there might be hope for moral progress. While that is a very simple summary of that chapter, I wanted to discuss moral progress in the context of more recent genocides. The Uyghur genocide in China and the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar are two examples. While they may receive a lot of initial attention, countries seem to go about dealing with them with economic sanctions, which is a mere slap on the wrist in some instances, and the public seems to quickly lose interest based on the news cycle. Does this lackluster international response complicate the notion that our morality is progressing, or do you still see a positive moral difference in the way we are currently reacting to atrocities compared to how we have reacted in the past? Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Um, it's a good question. What, you know, when you say that we haven't reacted in the right way to these uh, atrocities that you mention, you do have to say, well, what else could we have done apart from sanctions? And you might say, well, we, we could have had tougher sanctions. And I, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with that in many instances. But should we have gone to war with China or Burma because of their treatment of the Uyghur or the Rohingya? Um, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I think obviously with a major nation like, like China, that would be a horrendous thing to do. Um, yes, you know, the United States is overwhelming military superior to Burma. You might say we could stop them treating the Rohingya in that way. But, you know, our recent interventions, or American recent interventions in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and even Libya have not worked out that well. So um, I'm not in favor of uh, military intervention unless it's a very clear case of an ongoing atrocity that you can stop and the costs of doing that are likely to be very limited. Uh, so, you know, I did favor, uh, I think the intervention in, in Kosovo, um, the intervention uh, of, uh, that Vietnam carried out in Cambodia to stop the killing fields, um, I think was, was justifiable. Um, there are some cases like that, like, but, but not many. So you, you do have to ask what is what is a reasonable thing to do. Um, of course, you know, I regret these atrocities that you mentioned. I, I do think that they show that we haven't made enough moral progress. Um, but uh, at least you could say even these regimes have denied that they're carrying out genocide. They, they haven't said as as the Nazis might have said, um, we need to get rid of the Jews because, you know, they're a blight on the planet and uh, it's, the world will be better without them. They, they haven't a attempted that kind of justification or so-called justification. Um, so uh, perhaps, you know, this is lip service to moral progress, if you like, but maybe sometimes even lip service shows that we are making progress in our ideas, even if we're not universally making progress on the ground. Thank you, Peter. Here's a question now from Julian Colville, class of 2024 from Northfield, Minnesota, hometown Ipswich, Massachusetts. The past 48 hours, many St. Louis students have agreed to boycott your appearance on campus tonight, arguing that the propagation of your positions about infanticide is harmful to the campus community. 
especially those students who have disabilities for whom you would justify their having been killed as infants, isn't the emotional discomfort that your presence uh, reasonably causes these students, among others, an example of the suffering that you hope to avoid? There's, a, there's another part to this question, but I think I'm going to give you a chance to react to that. Right. Um, look, I regret any suffering that I'm causing, of course, but I don't think that taking offence at a view is a sufficient reason for put, failing to put forward a view that um, you know may be well defended and justifiable and may have some good consequences as well as those negative consequences. And uh, I think the view that I've put forward with regard to the treatment of infants with severe disabilities has some good consequences. And I just previously gave some examples of um, people, parents who've thought that it would have been better if their children had not lived. Um, and I think that's something that we should be more open to. Also, of course, there are cases where infants are not going to live anyway, but will still suffer for some time uh, while they continue to live, you know, not going to live very long. Uh, so the Netherlands actually does allow uh, non-voluntary euthanasia of infants in certain severe cases. There are actually very few. This has been allowed openly done for something like 15 years now, I think. It was written about in the New England Journal of Medicine by a couple of Dutch doctors. Um, and I think the total number of times it's been used is nine, if I remember rightly, nine or ten, something like that. Um, so it's rare but they think that it's in the best interest of the infants in some of those cases, because otherwise they would merely suffer longer. So I think it's useful to have this discussion. Um, if people have decided not to listen, of course, that's their right. They don't have to. But I think it's a pity. I, I would much rather they came along and asked probing and challenging questions, uh, as, as you've asked. And so then they could judge for themselves how well thought out my position is and whether there is something worth taking seriously here or whether there's just somebody who, you know, doesn't have any reasons for their view and appropriately should be boycotted. Thank you, Peter. Next video question, please. Hi, my name is Salem Burkholtz and I am a junior. I am submitting this question on behalf of Professor Marsh's biomedical ethics class and I am in course B. So my question entails your thoughts on world poverty so you talk about the morality of giving money to those in need in order to reduce the suffering worldwide. While I agree with this standpoint, my question comes with the effectiveness and ability of that money to be received. Organizations and country governments can be corrupt. For example, this could lead my donations to be allocated in a fund that does not benefit the population that I entailed it for, or the donations to never leave the port due to taxation. So if my donation never goes to the population, are my morals or beliefs that I did my um, part in ending suffering, are they even justified? Does my donation benefit me more in terms of boosting my own morale compared to the sender that I entailed it for? Thank you. Thanks for the question, Salem. Um, no, if your donation is goes to a corrupt government, um, or somehow is taxed at the port, uh, that's not justified and you shouldn't feel good about it. Um, you should feel bad because you didn't do your research properly in deciding who to give. If you go to the website of thelifeyoucansave.org, which as I mentioned is an organization that I co-founded, or others like givewell.org, select one of those organizations. None of those organizations give any money to governments, corrupt or not corrupt. They give money in some cases. There's an organization called GiveWell that transfers 90, at least 90 cents in every dollar you give them to uh, a family in extreme poverty in East Africa. Uh, or perhaps they turn the money into bed nets and they distribute bed nets directly to families in malaria prone regions who don't have them. Uh, and you know many other things like that. They perform cataract operations on people who are blind. Uh, they don't just hand over to, to governments the money to governments and, and the money doesn't get taxed. Um, that's not relevant here. I'm not sure why you're thinking about donations uh, being taxed. So um, it's not, you know, it's not that you're morally justified just because somehow you've given some money fairly blindly without thinking about where you're giving it. That's what the, the effective altruism organization is all about. It's saying 
do your research. It doesn't take much. Just go online. The information is there. Find independently assessed organizations, give your money to them. Then you don't have to worry about any of it going to corrupt governments or uh, getting taxed or not reaching the people that you want to help. Thank you, Peter. This uh, question from Max Bradley, class of 2022 uh, from St. Olaf College. How should one assess the value of pursuits such as the study of philosophy or the creation of art? Although many feel strongly that such pursuits are valuable in and of themselves, it seems clear that neglecting them in favor of, for example, charitable work would almost invariably result in far greater utility. Is there then any place in the moral life for valuing and devoting resources towards these pursuits? Thanks. Um, okay, so obviously I do think that there's some value in doing philosophy because I've been doing philosophy and I've been reaching a lot of people and I know that I've changed the views of some of those people. Um, and in fact, uh, I recently participated in two studies with a couple of philosophy colleagues, uh, Ed Schwitzgabel and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Eric Schwitzgabel and Brad Coquelet, um, in which we did a randomized trial of a discussion of the ethics of eating meat, uh, in which a large class and half the groups discussed eating meat and half the groups discussed giving to charity. And, and the thing that we could measure because the students at this university used their ID cards to buy their meals at the student cafeteria, or many of them did, um, was whether it actually had an effect on the number of meals, meat meals purchased. And, and it did. Uh, we showed a statistically significant drop in eating meat in those students who had been randomly allocated to the groups that discussed meat ethics and not in the other group. So philosophy makes a difference, um, and that's why it's worth doing. Now, is all philosophy worth doing? Um, there are obviously many areas of philosophy uh, about uh, metaphysics and epistemology and a whole range of other things, which aren't going to result in people changing their lives in any direct way. But they may help people to think clearly and, and uh, think straight about the complex universe in which we live. And I think very often, at least, they're, they're worth doing. Sometimes, at least for my taste, they get into such fine details of uh, particular philosophical positions that uh, I wonder whether this is really going to get back to the important issues that uh, are worth discussing. Um, so, so yes, philosophy gets, gets a pass, both in educational terms uh, and in terms of actually influencing people to do the right things. And I think a, a society and a university in which nobody thought about these deeper issues would be a poorer one and probably one in which people acted less well, less ethically than one in which people do think about these questions. What about art? Well, you could say that some of the great works of art um, have brought uh, pleasure and uh, stimulation and thought to many people. Um, and that's why they're preserved in uh, museums and art galleries and large numbers of people come to see them. Uh, and that means something. You could also say that some works of art direct our attention to some of the wrongs that are going in the world. Um, I guess a well-known example would be uh, Picasso's Guernica painting, a uh, painting of dramatizing the, the bombing of, of Guernica in Spain by the, the, the fascist forces who were supported by uh, Nazi Germany and, and Mussolini's Hitler, uh, sorry, Mussolini's Italy. Um, so yes, art can play this kind of role as well. Um, I think a lot of it doesn't though, I have to say. I'm, I'm somewhat less sympathetic to the way art has gone in recent decades and uh, particularly if this is being supported from public funds. Uh, I think many people nowadays believe that if they say I'm an artist and they produce something that gets shown in a gallery and that some people come and look at, that entitles them to support from public funds to get grants from uh, art foundations. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful about that. I, I do think that there are better things that they could be doing with their time quite often and there are better things that governments and foundations could be doing with their money. Um, if people support them in the market, if they produce something that people want to buy, um, maybe that's a different matter. But uh, even so, 
it may not be the best thing that they could be doing with their time. Thank you, Peter. I think we have time for one more video question. The last one, please. Hi, Dr. Singer. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. My name is Rowan Soba, and I'm with the Public Affairs Conversation. I wanted to ask you a question about your stance on moral objectivity. From a consequentialist framework, correct me if I'm wrong, the morally true or correct path to take is the one that generally causes the least amount of suffering um, and causes the most utility or happiness. Um, but how would you deal with difficult situations where the only difference in outcomes is who is experiencing the suffering or who is experiencing the utility? Um, how would you go about making calls about the moral truth in situations like that? This seems like a pertinent issue when talking about policy uh, and making compromises in general. Thanks. Thanks, Rowan. Um, perhaps just to, to begin, I should say that the questions of moral objectivity and whether there's truth in morality uh, are distinct from questions about what that truth is. So uh, I am a utilitarian who thinks that there is objective truth in morality. Um, but there have certainly been utilitarians. Uh, the Australian philosopher uh, Jack Smart, who wrote as JJC Smart, and uh, you can find his work in a little book called Utilitarianism for and Against, with uh, he co-wrote with Bernard Williams, uh, was not an objectivist. He was a utilitarian. His views about what we ought to do were similar to mine. But he thought that in the end, it was just a matter of what you wanted. And, uh, you know, his... Uh, he, he didn't argue for utilitarianism as an objective truth. He, he just hoped that people would feel benevolent. And if you feel benevolent, he thought, then you want to help people and not see people suffer. And, and that's all there is to it. And if you don't feel benevolent, there's no argument that one could put to you that would persuade you that you were wrong. So um, that's about objectivity. And then you, you asked a question about the specific moral truth about what is the truth, the right thing to do where the, there is suffering, but the, the question of your decision is who is going to experience that suffering. So just to, to get this clear, is it an absolute tie in terms of the quantities of suffering or the uh, quantities of, of pleasure or happiness that will be created? Because in a situation where it's just a tie, that is, let's say either I will feel suffering or you will feel suffering. and Nobody else is going to be affected. And we will each suffer exactly the same amount um, and by whatever decision is. Then um, I really think it's a tie. I don't think utilitarianism tells us what to do. You might as well flip a coin. But that's, of course, going to be a rare situation because people are different, circumstances are different. And in most cases, it will be a case where, let's say, you know, suppose we could quantify the amount of suffering um, if... I decide that you're the one who should suffer, then you will suffer a hundred units of pain. And if I decide that I'm the one who will suffer, I will suffer 99 units of pain or, or maybe less than that. But um, in that case, um, if um, I'm going to suffer less, then it's, uh, uh, then, you know, I'm the one who should bear the suffering because uh, it would be worse to create a hundred units of suffering than 99. So, that's consistent with the idea that we talked about earlier about uh, impartiality between individuals and just going by the quantity uh, if it's not an absolute tie. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. We come now to the end of our time. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining us tonight in this stimulating exchange with Peter Singer. And thanks so much to you, Peter, for our conversation on the point of view of the universe. Thanks very much. I thank uh, you for your thoughtful questions and leading the discussion. I thank all of the students who asked questions. Um, and I thank those students who didn't get a chance to ask a question, perhaps, but, uh, but who were listening and who I hope were stimulated and made to think uh, about the issues that we've discussed. This spring term, St. Olaf College's Institute for Freedom and Community continues its series of public events on contemporary controversies. The next event in this series is with the enormously provocative linguist and social commentator John McWhorter on the topic of anti-racism as religion. That event will happen almost a month from now on Monday, March 14th at 7 p.m. Central Time. 
Learn more about this event and other institute events at institute.stolaf.edu. That's institute.stolaf.edu. We hope you can join us for these events. But for now, good night, be safe, and be well.